Thank you, Eva, and uh, warmly welcome to this second uh, Luomus Syke machine learning seminar. We have again uh, a brilliant agenda and several presentations on the on the latest achievements on on machine learning field. What I'd like to say uh, to put it to maybe a larger context uh, is that. Uh, Finland is uh, currently working on several strategies and new uh, laws or acts, uh, acts on, on the field of environment and biodiversity. I've been involved in uh, uh, making the strategy for environmental monitoring in larger sense, uh, uh, also environmental um, uh, monitoring other than biodiversity only and also in making the biodiversity strategy and action plan for our country. And in both uh, works, they are at bits, uh, different stages, the machine learning is mentioned and the environmental monitoring, monitoring strategy is already mentioning that we'll need to use machine learning and, uh, and the latest techniques to help the work and monitoring in the future. Uh, the techniques will certainly help us and we'll need to use uh, as many techniques as possible. But of course, we understand that it cannot solve the actual biodiversity crisis. We also need the decisions to, uh, to act differently. But uh, I'm very happy to follow this field and, and, that, and the development, and I'm sure that we'll be able to offer some new solutions for, for the field and for the best of biodiversity. Warmly welcome. Thank you, Aino. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, the speaker or the welcoming words were by Aino Juslen, who is the leader of uh, Luomus, Finnish Museum of Natural History. And um, my name is Eva Maria Tiedenberg, and I'm giving quickly some instructions for this afternoon. We will have many interesting presentations that are to be like 10 minutes or 12 minutes each, and then um, some minutes time for discussion. You can also um, write some questions in the chat panel and we can take those questions later on. And um, we will have a, a short break in between the two sessions at around two o'clock. And um, after all these talks, we will have a synthesis kindly provided by Otso Ovaskainen, who is listening to your talks and um, yeah, preparing the the uh, synthesis of all these all these research aspects that have been discussed today. Um, this webinar is recorded and will be provided online later on with the um, texts. So uh, you will be finding this this recording later in the event page. We are still getting some more participants and it might happen that we are getting many more during the afternoon as there have been quite many people interested in this webinar. Um, I think this is all about the uh, instructions and we are ready to start with the first presentation. It's by uh, Vuokko Hekinheimo, who is a senior researcher in SYKE. Finnish Environment Institute, and the title is Exploring Human Activities in Nature Using Social Media, Photographs and Computer Vision. Okay, please walk to the stage is yours. Okay, thanks for the introduction, and I assume you see now the full pre page presentation there. So, uh, my name is indeed Vuokko Hekinheimo, I work at SYKE. As said, but I graduated from University of Helsinki Digital Geography Lab, and I will now present some work uh, done uh, during my PhD with colleagues uh, and tell you about how we used computer vision to explore activities uh, in national parks. So I have to 
make a disclaimer at, uh, at the start that I'm not the machine learning wizard in this work, so all the tricky questions can be then sent to Tuomas Väisänen, but I'll try to do my best, uh, best to describe the methods as well. Mm. OK, so the broad aim in our project has been uh, to understand uh, the threats and opportunities related to nature conservation, uh, human nature interactions. So of course, there's human pressures, let's say illegal wildlife trade topics like this, and then opportunities, ecotourism, nature based uh, solutions uh, that we have been aiming to uh, investigate using novel data sources such as social media data. So we had this Somecon project that ended ended this year where I did my PhD more related on the spatial and temporal analysis. But then we have also in the group done done this uh, content analysis using computer vision and natural language processing. <clears throat> uh, this is a quick overview of the kind of uh, whole whole project as we did. So we explored the spatial pa patterns. Where do people visit national parks? Where do the visitor come come from? Perhaps characterize a bit the language groups uh, and the user base of the data we analyzed. Then of course also temporal uh, analysis. So we have been able to compare our results with uh, official visitor data from Finland and South Africa to some extent, uh, and then to understand the preferences, the kind of pull factors, motivations of visits, visit activities. Uh, so we have then conducted uh, visual content analysis, both manual and automated, and then uh, text content analysis as well. And I will then now zoom into the um, uh, visual content analysis. So when we started the project in 2015, we had this uh, very advanced uh, Microsoft Access based uh, annotation tool and we invited uh, tens of students, bought some pizza and we annotated uh, many images from South Africa and Finland and were able then to compare, uh, for example, the preferences of visitors towards biodiversity uh, from social media and then based on surveyed preferences. Uh, then, of course, thinking of the amount of data we then uh, comes in machine learning. So we have then also uh, explored uh, various computer vision methods uh, during during the project. In this in this image, the labels are maybe not not so visible, but on the left left hand side, there is an example of instance segmentation. So detecting an object and its location in the photo and giving it a label. And on the right hand side, there is an example of dense captioning, which then combines uh, computer vision and uh, natural language processing to describe, to give a more rich description of, of the image. Uh, so why we went for computer vision in this project, of course, the sheer amount of data, and then within this field, especially in the kind of uh, nature recreation side, uh, the application of computer vision methods specifically uh, as apart from text content analysis methods remain still under explored. There are some examples, for example, using this Google uh, Google APIs and such. Um, and then, of course, when if we want to understand human preferences, uh, the image has has a lot of rich content in addition to the image captions, for example. And then, of course, the ultimate goal would be to combine information from both the kind of visual visual content and text content uh, to account for the multimodal communication. Uh, so then uh, I'll talk a bit more in detail about uh, a recent uh, paper that was published early this year. Uh, so we had collected uh, all publicly shared geotagged geo uh, photos from the Flickr platform in this case. In other works, we have also used data from other platforms. So there were some 15,000 photos by a bit less than 1,000 uh, users. Uh, uh, and then we further manually classified these uh, users into domestic and foreign visitors based on the profile information. And for the content analysis, we took the most 20 most popular parks because then for the 20 least uh, pop popular parks, there were, weren't so much data. And we did the analysis on the level of these predetermined landscape regions. 
uh, to have a bit more bit more data data per region. And then of course, when doing do, doing image processing, there were uh, quite a lot of pre-processing. So we had to resize the images, uh, fix the aspect ratio, and so on and so forth. So details on those pre-processing steps are described in the manuscript. Uh, and in this study, we uh, applied and tested uh, three different types of methods. So these were kind of off-the-shelf computer vision models. So we didn't train them ourselves, used pre-trained uh, pre -trained models. So the first one is semantic clustering. And there the aim was to get kind of a generic overview of the data to summarize the vast amount of data, get, get an idea what do people post about in national parks. Uh, then the second one uh, was scene classification. So there the goal is to look at the landscape uh, and characterize the, the scenery. And then the third one is instance level object detection to tap into the activities. So as we're now in in the Finnish context, there are not so much um, photos about at least wild animals. Of course, some some amount of bird photos, for example, reindeers, dogs. Uh, but here we fo focused more on the object, objects that reflect uh, recreational activities. So I'll try to walk you through these methods a bit more in detail. And the scripts are available on the Digital Geography Lab uh, GitHub page if you're interested. Uh, so this semantic clustering. So indeed, the aim was to understand and summarize the uh, the type of type of images that that people had shared or wanted to share from from their national park visits, uh, and it was based on a pre-trained neural network that was trained to uh, detect thousand distinct uh, categories. And as an output from there, uh, kind of without going to the actual final classification, we used the kind of uh, high dimensional feature vector then to uh, characterize the content, uh, which then went through this dimensionality re reduction method called UMAP. So that's short for, for uniform manifold approximation project and projection. Uh, all I know about that is that it's kind of a PCA type method that in a way uh, flattens the most relevant content uh, in this, uh, based on these features. And from there, uh, an example is this image here where the thumb thumbnails are, are plotted in this two dimensional UMAP representation. And I'll walk you through a couple of examples rather quickly from there. So this is now the UMAP uh, result from this uh, semantic clustering and each dot is one image and the color represents the landscape region. And the point here is that similar similar photos are located near near each other. And here you can see how it's in a way geographically distributed. Mm, and here is the uh, image from the previous one. So with the thumbnails, you can start seeing some patterns. These um, in a way clusters are manually manually added by us as an interpretation. So winter winter photos from forests are, are clustered together, then orienteering photos, pictures from forests, seas, lakes, dogs was one, one distinct content. So from here you can see a generic overview of what do people post about. Then in the article, our goal was to detect differences between foreign and domestic visitors. So here you can start seeing some patterns that perhaps then, well, Foreigners uh, post a lot of photos of their fir first um, exotic ski trip and so on and so forth. Okay. So then off to the second method, which was scene classification. Uh, so zooming into the landscapes. So there we classified the photos into predefined uh, categories. So as output, we get potential categories and then confidence scores for those. Mm, I'll try to explain this quickly. So this is kind of a categorical scatter plot. So we have the categories, scene categories on the x-axis, and then the confidence score uh, on the y-axis. Uh, blue dots are domestic visitors, orange ones are foreign visitors. And from, from here, for example, you can see that uh, on the upper right, right hand most side, there's tundra photos, so picture from Lapish parks. Uh, quite confidently uh, classified. So one image might then have several classes. 
uh, classes assigned to the photo. So this, this worked quite well. The pre-trained model had some weird classes such as, let's say, uh, savanna that were then classified into if, if we had some like snow field or, or water. So some of these kind of uh, semantic mixes. Uh, okay, and then instance level object detection for detecting objects in order to interpret uh, activities. Um, and there, there again, there was a pre-trained model. Mm, and maybe I'll just jump in here. So on here, the results of the object detection are plotted on the UMAP uh, visualization. On the left-hand side, there are the kind of topmost uh, categories detected and then on the right hand side there are these objects that are then related to distinct activities. So for example birds in uh, broadleaf forest and so on. So this again helps us to characterize the content, explore it further and perhaps develop further research questions. Okay, I'll start wrapping up uh, in the couple of next slides. So of course uh, there's always uh, bias depending on on the training data in the in the models. Uh, so so of course, if applying this global, for example, this global uh, uh, places data set on scenery from Finland, then there might might not be some sceneries represented at all in there. Uh, and then, for example, there were some giraffes found in Arctic Lapland in the data. OK, that might not be true, but then it was an animal, which is, of course, ac accurate enough in some analysis. And then as we're analyzing social media data, ownership privacy issues need to be considered. Here we analyzed publicly shared Flickr photos. Of course, these methods could be then applied to, let's say, crowdsourced Im images or camera trap images. Uh, and what did we learn? The take home messages. Um, so these were quite encouragingly well worked, uh, the off-the-shelf off models. Uh, and then we found, found some interesting differences between the user groups in there. And we have also presented these re results to Metsähallitus, Metsähallitus and in, in international conferences. And of course, then there's the question that how, how could, are these useful for actual visitor monitoring? Mm, uh, and then here, as we presented these the three different approaches, so they complement each other. And then how this now links to my current work or future interests. So, of course, we have done these comparisons with the survey data, so it would be uh, interesting to validate this further. Uh, one point I didn't mention that uh, more than 70% of the users in the data were identified as male. So these are kind of the, well, male bird watchers. Uh, view of the Finnish national parks, let's say. So uh, to cut some corners and then uh, also would be interesting to zoom into the urban environment. So there are some some work done, for example, re related to the amount of green uh, from the pedestrian points of view or the perceived uh, quality of the urban environment. So those kinds of questions are would be exciting to explore further. Uh, some further reading and thank you. I hope I did well with the time. So please, if you have any questions, ask now or contact me or Vaiski if you have the technical questions. <coughs> okay, thank you, Volko. For oh, very, very interesting and clear presentation. So now we have a couple of minutes time to uh, ask questions if you have or say some comments. Eero Sivola. Uh, hi, Volko. Thanks for the presentation. So uh, one thing I, I've seen you present this once before and one thing that came to my mind is uh, because you use these pre-trained uh, neural networks. Uh, so. Did you notice any bias in detection of these activities? Uh, did you notice, for instance, that they they were not that accurate, for instance, skiing activities? Or uh, did you notice anything that this sort, sort that uh, like 
would act as a word of caution for someone who would try to want like use these methods for their own data? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, again, Vaisky did most of the kind of checking and in detail validating, but as, as far as I understood, the results were rather good. So on the level of like even ski, skiing was de detected ski tracks, then of course there might be these like, well, eating is one popular activity. So I'm not sure if a sausage was detected, but this like it, it depends on the level of detail you want to go into. But at least if you then there might be well, especially then with animals, I, I bet these models that we used are not super accurate enough if you get giraffe, giraffes in Lapland. But then if you generalize, indeed, if you want to know if people took pictures of animals and then zoom into there, so good enough, but depends on the question. So, yeah. So bird bird species probably wouldn't be quite all right. So and there you would maybe want to use the information present in the captions because often people even even provide the scientific name there. So no need to do any further further AI work there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Are there are other questions or comments? There wasn't any in the chat. So if if there aren't any comments or questions, I think we can continue with our next speaker. Yes, thank you, Anne. Uh, we are moderating this event together with Anne Koivunen, my colleague from Luomus. The next speaker is Louis Forsblum, who is a researcher in Syke, and the title is Species distribution modeling of aquatic species using boosted regression um, trees, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, perfect. Uh, I, as, as mentioned, I work at SUKE in the group for uh, sustainable use of marine areas and my presentation will give you all a brief overview of boosted regression trees, after which I will show you one of the 200 models that have been produced using the extensive underwater mapping data gathered within the VELMO program. The modeling has been a group effort with many people contributing to this over the years. And uh, oh, yes. um, so species distribution models are correlative models that can be used to model the relationship between species observation and the environment. Uh, observations can be consist of point data or abundances, and SDMs can enable us to make predictions in both time and space. And uh, these models can be fit with many approaches, and most of you have used uh, generalized linear models or additive models uh, for this purpose, uh, but you can also use uh, boosted regression trees. And Boosted regression trees are not exactly new, and in 2008 there was a paper by Elith et al. Uh, with a step-by-step -step guide for how to fit these models using ecological data. And it has since gotten over 4,000 citations, according to Google Scholar, and there has been a huge amount of research into this type of models. Uh, there are also multiple tools for fitting these models available in, for example, R. Uh, but what are boosted regression trees? Uh, boosted regression trees are a combination of two concepts, decision trees and boosting. One example of a decision tree could look like this with two variables, x, 1 and 2 where the prediction space is partitioned to rectangles. Each region is identified to have homogeneous response to the predictor. And in the case of a regression tree, this would be the mean response for observations in that area. Uh, boosting is a 
numerical optimization technique that minimizes the loss function. So basically, boosting combines uh, many all right models and to make one good model. And um, the first uh, three uh, added uh, will reduce uh, loss function. And uh, there are uh, residuals uh, left after this first three. And the next uh, three will then be fit, fit to these uh, residuals. And this will be on and on and on, go on and on and on as trees are added step by step. So basically, you can keep adding trees until you are way uh, overfitting your model. So you need to pay attention to how many trees uh, you fit. Uh, another thing that will influence your model is uh, the learning rate, which describes how fast uh, this uh, modeling will move forward. Basically, how much each individual tree uh, will be contributing to the final model. And trees can vary in complexity. Uh, here you can see a more complex tree, but basically if the tree complexity was one, you would only have a small uh, uh, tree stump, so to say. And additionally, you can control uh, how much data is used uh, in each iteration. So you can introduce some stochasticity by uh, manipulating the bag fraction. So now you know the basics of what a boosted regression tree is. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the species in the background, bladder rack. Uh, as you can see, there have been thousands of observations of bladder wreck uh, in the Finnish uh, coastal area. And what is no, not shown is that there is, are even more uh, observations of the absence of the species, since these are also important. And we expect that salinity and hard substrate will be very influential for this species, as it restricts, salinity restricts its distribution to the north, and uh, the species requires a hard substrate to attach to. So uh, the first step when uh, fitting a BRT is to split your data into calibration and validation data. You want to use a part of the data to calibrate your model and leave some for the validation. And all the uh, modeling I have done uh, is uh, by using the GBM package in R. So you need to somehow control how many trees you add, and you can uh, visualize how uh, the addition of trees changes uh, how good your model is. So here you can see how the uh, holdout deviance decreases as the modeling effort uh, progresses by an addition of each tree. And we actually had a pretty good idea of where to start with, with learning rate and bag fraction and so on, because this is not the first time we are fitting these 200 models. And this is actually an example of a pretty nice, well-behaving model. Uh, if the model, par if the parameters needed tweaking, uh, it might look something like this. And how well can the model predict the distribution of the species? Well, we can look at the receiver operating characteristic curve, uh, and uh, which is basically the relationship between the true positives and the false positives. Uh, and for this, we have used the validation uh, data that was not used to fit the model. And this, is, this actually looks very nice. And the distributions predicted using the, using the model also makes sense. So we have uh, 12,000 unique trees. How do we make sense of all of those trees? So we can look at the relative importance of predictors, uh, which is the number of times a variable is selected for splitting. 
weighted by the squared improvement to the model as a result of each split and averaged over all trees. Uh, and the relative influence is then scaled to 100. So salinity contributes 12.9%. And the rest of the uh, figure is the partial dependence function. So basically the effect of salinity on the response after accounting for the average effect of the other variables. So this looks quite good. Uh, after uh, when we salinity drops below four, we don't have a bladder rack anymore, which makes sense. And most of the bladder rack uh, is uh, distributed around like five to six PSU. But what is happening above six PSU? Uh, bladder rack is also known uh, to show up in the south of Sweden, for example, where salinity definitely is higher. So this is a good example of how these models can be really uh, poor to predict uh, uh, to predict the distribution of species in other areas. So I mean, this would work fine for the Finnish coastal area, but it would not work fine in an area where the salinity is higher. So uh, how what comes out of the model really depends on what went in. And we knew that Fugus needed a hard substrate uh, to attach to. And here you can see the influence of uh, rocky substrates. So basically the probability that there will be some rocks uh, around. And as you can see, uh, the decrease uh, the increase is kind of linear, but this uh, type of models are really poor at predicting linear relationships. So basically they can't predict a straight line. So the Velmo underwater mapping project has to date gathered over 170,000 underwater observations. And you saw one of these models, but there are 200 more. And uh, there are models of common species, such as clasping leaf pondweed. Uh, we have models of bladder wreck and blue mussels, uh, which uh, form key uh, uh, habitats. Uh, we have models for threatened species, such as the Baltic water plantain, and some of the models for threatened species have even uh, have even enabled us to find new occurrences uh, of these species. And there are also models of rare and sparsely occurring species, such as uh, eelgrass. And we have even tried modeling non-indigenous species. These are a bit more tricky because uh, if the species is uh, still invading, like for example, we have a zebra mussel here in the picture, then we can't really be sure if the species already occupies all the areas it potentially could occupy. So uh, the model might not work that well. We also have uh, models of uh, habitat types based on the threat and status of IUCN red list of ecosystems. And one example of those are, for example, bottoms dominated by red algae. And uh, next, uh, a snapshot of what all these models have been used for so far. Um, the models have been used as input for spatial prioritization to investigate uh, marine protected area networks. Uh, this was published by Vertanen et al. in 2018 uh, to uh, fit the species distribution models. We also need some uh, layers on abiotic data. So uh, here is uh, abiotic uh, uh, model that we fit using uh, BRT. Uh, this shows uh, the sediment cover on uh, vegetation. And in the Marea project, we are currently working on producing spatial level uh, layers of ecosystem service potential 
uh, based on individual species models. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Louis, for very uh, um, for your uh, interesting talk on very important topic. So now we we have a um, couple of minutes time to ask some questions and make some comments. There wasn't any comments on the chat. But if there doesn't arise any questions now, we have this opportunity to ask uh, at the end of this session some questions. But uh, Eero has something. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I was just wondering because you had so huge amounts of input data. Did you like? Uh, was it? Did you assess its quality? Because I assume that it's collected during many, many years and with like many different uh, observers have observed the data. So how was the quality of the input data? Well, at least for Fucus, the quality is quite good uh, because it's a big species. You can see it easily and the data has been gathered by two main methods, by scuba diving or by uh, these drop videos. So this is actually one of the species that, that is really uh, easy to even recognize from a drop video. But sure, there are other species where we couldn't use the full data set. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Thank you, Louise. Um, I think we will move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Mikko Heikkinen from Luomus, the Biodiversity Informatics Unit. He works as an IT specialist. And the topic of Mikko today is machine learning for anyone analyzing text and data. Please. Thank you. I'll share my screen. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. OK, so uh, I'm Mikko Heikkinen. Uh, I'm working at the Species Information Team uh, at LOMUS. Uh, I work with biodiversity data. I coordinate development of many of the services of the Finnish Biodiversity Information Facility, related to Keskus. Um, however, here I'm going to show you uh, things that I've done mostly on my free time. So these are not used by LOMS or FinBIF, at least not yet. Um, I'm a biologist by education. I've been working a long time with IT and software development, websites, databases, so forth. Um, but unlike many or maybe most other speakers here, I'm not really a machine learning specialist. So I'm starting from the basics here. So this is my main message here. Um, you don't need to be a specialist in order to start making machine learning models and use them. Um, you don't need a team of people nowadays and, or a research project working with AI tools. There are many automated tools that can be used without uh, deep technical knowledge. Um, please don't get me wrong. Specialists can usually uh, make much better models than what I show here. Uh, but the aim of this talk is to encourage you or anyone uh, to start tinkering with uh, machine learning tools and maybe to see if you can apply them what, to what you work on. Uh, so since I'm not, not an expert, I'm starting from the basics here. Uh, goal of using a machine learning is usually uh, to do an autom or automate a routine or repeating task that you don't have time to do manually. And the solution with machine learning is to train a computer to do the task and making it learn on its own how to do the task. Um, and a model, this uh, word is often used here, model is the piece of software, simplified model is the piece of software that can, can eventually do the task on its own. 
So uh, to give an example, I talked at the last machine learning seminar last spring about um, analyzing images. An example from there. Uh, here are photos from a camera that point that is pointing upwards towards the sky. Now, if I want to know when there's a bird in the photo, how can I do that? The camera takes a photo of every, one photo every second. So no one has really time to look over all the photos. So we need the machine to a computer to help. So instead of describing to the computer uh, what a bird looks like, what an airplane looks like, uh, the idea with machine learning is to let the computer learn by itself by providing training data. So I can just say that, hey, these are clouds, these are aircrafts, these are insects, birds, so forth. And then the computer figure out, figures out on its own how to create a model that fits to these labels or classes on its own. So then if we give the model a completely new photo that it has never seen before, it can still say what it is. This is a bird or this is an aircraft. Um, here's one way to illustrate the process of uh, how to make a machine learning model. Um, first, define the problem, think about what you're trying to solve, then prepare training data, uh, prepare preferably lots of good quality data. Then you can do things like uh, feature engineering to ad uh, adjust the data uh, into a form that is more easily um, analyzed by the computer. Then you can select a statistical model, then you will train the model, and then you can do something called tuning to hyperparameters. Don't ask me what's that, I can't explain. And then eventually you get the model and you can use it, deploy and run it. Uh, auto ML is a term that's often used to describe the kind of tools that automate much of this process. So what they do is that they remove the most of the technical steps into the process. So you only need to think about the problem, prepare data, and then you will get the model. Basically, that's it. So you don't need uh, um, experience in programming, for example, to do this. Usually, this is the hardest part, preparing good quality da training data and preparing enough of it. That's the uh, bottleneck here. It can take a lot of time. So to then how to um, how to apply this process to textual data. Uh, I've been using a tool called Google AutoML natural language. Uh, that's not by far the only uh, only tool available. There are many tools by many providers, smaller ones and bigger ones. Uh, but this is something I know about. Um, so I have here a few examples uh, that deal with nature observation data that I got from the FinBIF observation services. Um, the idea here is similar to the images I showed earlier to just classify content automatically. This time it's just uh, about text and not images. So uh, first example, uh, interpreting bird observations. So uh, bird watchers, uh, often use different kind of codes and uh, short notes to describe their observations. Uh, so the problem is how to get this data structured so it can be used better. Uh, <clears throat> so if, for example, if I want to only see uh, or analyze observations that are about uh, nesting birds or uh, about uh, migrating birds, how do I separate those from the rest? Uh, well, the traditional way uh, to solve this is to uh, instruct the observers uh, to enter the data in a structured format, to enter it into multiple fields, and then hope that they actually do that. Uh, but that can be a lot of work, and based on, um, for example, a survey we did last summer uh, at FinBIF, uh, the lack of time is the biggest factor preventing people to um, entering their observations into a common system. So how could we make the lives of the people easier? Could we use uh, machine learning here to interpret the data? So I tried this out and it seems, yes, we can with over 90% precision. 
that sounds pretty good. Uh, so I, I had 3000 rows of training data, observations, bird observations, and classified uh, to seven or so classes. And it worked well. Uh, here are some examples of uh, uh, data that it correctly interpret. So there can be a lot of different kinds of textual descriptions that a bird is singing on a branch on a pine tree and doesn't know uh, doesn't notice the people passing by, or they can use these short codes like uh, capital letter A is uh, meaning singing, and so forth. So it seems that it's a, a, it can interpret this pretty well automatically. And with the automatic tools, it took something like a, a one day to create a model like this. Uh, second example, uh, interpreting uh, free form notes. So what if we want to uh, know uh, if an observation contains some kind of information about the habitat or biotope of the observation? We could use this to uh, see in which kind of places uh, certain species live. And so here are some examples, again in Finnish, uh, describing the microhabitat or larger habitat where the observation is from. Can we detect this out of different kinds of data? And here the results were not so good. I got about 80% precision. It seems that the nodes are varying too much, so it's uh, uh, it's difficult for the model to interpret them. So there were quite a few false negatives, like this example here describes both the place and the habitat. On or there were false positives, like. Uh, description saying saying that uh, this was a photo by an automatic camera and the model thinks that that's a habitat. Then um, how, how, how to analyze tabular data. Uh, there's a tool for this also by Google, AutoML tables, but I'm sure there are other tools by other providers. Uh, so way to think about this is to think about an Excel table where one column has missing values. So can we predict the missing value based on the other columns the data has? And as an example, I tried to use uh, 30,000 or so observations from uh, iNaturalist observation service. And the goal was to um, detect which of the observations uh, are about garden plants. Many, many people take photos of their garden plants and submit that, those as an observation. And we are usually not that interested uh, in garden plants. Can we predict which observations are from a garden so that we could manually check them? So I uh, created a model based, uh, using the system by Google, entering things like uh, uh, taxon name, uh, taxonomic hierarchy, species group, location, observer name, so forth. And it seems it's quite complicated. Uh, in theory, I got 90% precision here, but in practice it felt that it's more like 25% precision when it was used in with um, fresh data. So here it seems that um, uh, the problem is that making good training data is difficult. We would need a lot of uh, well-checked error-free data, tens of thousands of rows preferably. We could also include additional data, so things like biotope, mm. presuming that urban areas have more observations for garden plants, or categorizing users to new users, or experienced users, presuming that new users perhaps make more observations of garden plants. But these were a few examples. Uh, in the end, there are endless of endless number of applications uh, which these could be used on. So you don't need to be an expert to do something. Uh, using these kind of tools, creating uh, good training data, that's the bottleneck. That takes a lot of time. Uh, and something to note also, uh, these kind of uh, models can have unknown biases, so they should be used carefully. Basically, a model created like this is a black box. You just give it something and then it gives its interpretation, but you don't really know why it 
gave that kind of interpretation. So uh, you need to use the results carefully. So um, the question is again, what could you do with these kind of tools? Do you have ideas? I'd be happy to hear on the chat or by email. Thanks. Many thanks, Mikko, for your encouraging talk for us non-experts on the subject. So now the floor is open for questions and comments. Vuokko Heikinheimo. Yeah, thanks Mikko, refreshing presentation and indeed we all can do machine, machine learning if we wish. I'm just wondering as a geographer and a cartographer, is it a bit the same thing that anybody can do maps nowadays? So then at the end of the day, in order to make informative maps or models or results, then you need some, at least we believe you need some understanding of the, of the underlying theory of cartographic visualization. That was just a comment. Uh, you can re of course respond, but I wanted to ask specifically, at least in the Google Cloud Vision API, there are there is some pricing if you put like loads and loads of data. So these tools that you tested, are they free or is there some limit to the amount of data? Um, they are not free, but when you sign up, they give you a free credit. So everything I've done so far has been free for me. So, and it isn't that expensive. I, um, for example, the Word data model I created, it would have cost like $20 to make, something like that. Okay. Any more questions or comments? I saw Perhaps. some hands. Okay. It was maybe my hand again. I had trouble putting it down. Yeah. <laughs> there isn't. I, I, I can't see any, any hands up at the moment. OK, so maybe, thank you, Mikko. Yeah. I think we can then move on. OK, Our thanks. Next, yeah, thank you. Our next speaker is Tommi Mononen, who is a university researcher in Otso Ovaskainen's group and life plan project. And the title is An Active um, Learning Approach to Analyzing Camera Trap Data. So please, Tommy, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you. So we have this life plan project, so which is doing a planetary inventory of life. So practically we want to sample all over the world uh, different uh, animal species. So, for example, we have audio recorders, we have uh, malaise traps, and we have also camera traps, and I'm talking about those. So, camera traps are, of course, trail cameras, and our trail cameras look like this. So we have something like 100 sites all over the world and five cameras in each site. And we can also take night photographs. So these cameras has these infrared flash panels and they detect animals or animal movement using passive infrared lens sensor, which is here. And also, of course, lens here. And here you can see three, uh, three days in France. So what one camera has captured. So each time camera is triggered, it will take five photos. So you see some kind of movement there. Almost like video. And you see that there are mostly like cats and foxes. And maybe some birds. I don't remember if this has. And yeah, as we have these uh, 
huge variety of habitats. So these four pictures have been taken within one month. And so you, it was winter in Finland, summer in Australia, and something in between in France at that time. So, and my main uh, talk or topic here is active learning. So in traditional learning, you need this large labeled training data. Maybe for deep learning models, it might be like tens of thousands of images or 100,000 images or more. Then you have this training data, you feed it in, it in to your model and you get your trained model, which is ready for classification uh, classification and you can use that to classificate uh, unknown images. So with active learning, you actually need uh, start from small label training data. So you can select just your if you decide to, for example, separate cats from dogs, you give like examples of cats and examples of dogs. And then you feed this small data to model, which is in uh, at this stage uh, really crappy. And then you let the model kind of decide uh, which images it wants you to give labels. So it asks some labels for some images and then user annotates those and then these new labeled images will be added to training set, training data. And then you make this cycle all over again until you or user is happy with the results. So the model is actually classifying well. So benefits of this active learning is that you can kind of select good quality training samples. It's not just like some citizen science pro project that actually has labeled a lot of crappy images, but you actually can select the good samples or say that I won't give label for this image because it's too crappy. So you can also decide to that even if the model asks label for that. So and you get faster learning as your images are better quality, then you get better results with fewer samples. Yeah, and and one way to uh, do this active learning or deep learning uh, for images is of course these convolutional neural networks. So basically you have your set of images, then you shrink them. So or original images to smaller ones. For example, this model eats uh, this size images. And then the model starts to shrink information. So it does the information ex extraction until it ends up to one vector of values, which is kind of final product. And this final product is used for classification. So learning this model is learning all these how to do information extraction and, and classification, and it's uh, learned during training phase. But what is active learning? So basically, uh, it's additional algorithm, so which takes these vectors. So each of these points here are, this is image space, and each of these points are just images. And uh, then some images have, have been labeled already, and some others are not. And in active learning, you kind of try to, the algorithm uh, try to find uh, labels or ask labels, uh, such labels that are not near any uh, previously labeled ones, but still uh, model is rather confident. So I have noticed that this is a good policy that model is rather confident with uh, the label. Then you can kind of say that, yes, you are right. The model is right as you are classifying images. 
uh, that model gave you, you are right. And, and then model is more sure. Or you can say, no, you are not right. And then model kind of uh, fixes the next round, uh, these weights here. So, and after that, you go all over this loop uh, to get better results. And what you like, what ordinary user does in uh, when using this model. So, for example, if you want to classify human images against other images, so you give a find from uh, image set some examples, good examples uh, for human images and some good examples of other images. You train the model. At least uh, this is really lousy model now. And then in e after each round, a uh, user will kind of observe these uh, test test histogram. So e these are just images. There are a lot of lot of human images according to this model, and some uh, other images here. So if these images are in the this end, then mo the model is really sure about that. The yes, uh, it's classifying uh, correctly, 100% correctly. And if this end, then it thinks that no, this is definitely not human image. And then this uh, algorithm will take from these sure areas, these new proposals for images to be, to be labeled. And then the model is trained again. And in the final round, so user just decides that now it's doing well. There are not like uh, a lot of images in the gray area between human and other images. And then you can test this model with unseen data. So, and this is confusion matrix, one of my tests. So you can see that correctly classified these green ones here are majority and there are just little misclassified and and also accuracy is high. So suggested practices for how to uh, train the model is for example that at first you should only give like if you are classifying dogs you only dog uh, those images where dog is clearly seen and so same way as you say, it, for example, your child, a really young child, that that is a dog. You don't say that that is a dog when when dog, uh, he or she sees only the tail. So, and do not include any images that which represent both classes. So if you are kind of uh, comparing uh, dog images with human images, you don't want to classify this case where you have both. Because if you say that it's a dog image, then it's clearly incorrect and other way around also. And if you are unsure, many times you may be unsure about correct class. If you also want to include shadows of uh, human or dogs, then you don't know which one this is. And so pluses and minuses. So advantages are like user can annotate less images and because those images are better quality, uh, you get better results. And it's easy to fa and fast also to modify this classification. If you decide that this was not correct classification, classification you have not done a lot of work in classifying images, so you can just start all over again. And also then kind of minus side, on the minus side you have uh, that running steps might be slow, so it will take a lot of time, uh, although you don't spend time, but you are, spend time for waiting until the model asks next time what images you should classify. And then there is also danger of subjectivity. So if in the middle you check like results, then you might change your inner, how you label images. You kind of try to help the model 
uh, to classify better and then you actually actually change your initial thought of classes so that's kind of that thing so yeah that was my talk any questions thank you tommy for your very fascinating talk So any questions or comments? I have one. one. Uh, can you estimate how many rounds it usually takes to get the model working properly? So there, yeah, it's less than 10 rounds, maybe if you have uh, larger image uh, numbers, it depends how. So you have to, of course, ask more uh, or decide how many uh, labels model will ask. So mm -hmm. if you uh, if it asks like 1000 labels or 100 labels, it's it's different thing. So Basically, thing is that if you label more images at the early stage, so you let it, let the model ask more labels, then it can kind of be very unoptimal. The most optimal thing would be ask one label per time, but then you should always wait for new new question. So thing is that uh, yeah you want to use as little time for waiting as you can and there is some kind of optimum uh, how many uh, different labels the model should ask and uh, and how much you want to wait okay so it's the sort of balancing game yeah thank you Okay, I think we are ready for our next speaker. Okay, thank you, Tommy. Our next speaker I already see is here. Um, Alessandro Zito from Duke University and working together with also Ovaskainen yes. research group. And the title is a bit shorter than in, in the event page is now taxonomic classification methods for DNA methods. Okay. Uh, wait one second because I yes. think I cannot. Uh, okay. Okay, Ap apologies, I had to restart uh, Teams because it was not allowing for, uh, for screen sharing. Okay. Um, oh no. Okay, can you uh, see my slides? Yes, we can see them, but they are rather small. Yeah, now it's good. Thank Perfect. you. Okay, hello everyone and thank you very much for uh, uh, having me today. Uh, this is uh, a Pre a, a talk that's gonna uh, be about uh, my current work with Otto Vaskainen and uh, um, a lot of other uh, um, brilliant researchers uh, in the Life Plan group. Uh, in particular, we're talking about Panu Samuevo, uh, Thomas Origon, David Danson, who's my PhD advisor here at Duke. And then we have also Jesse Harrison, Marcus Cossell, and Thomas Roslin. Now, our goal is actually to benchmark different taxonomic classification methods for uh, DNA sequences. So you're right, the title is a little bit shorter, because uh, what I'm going to do in this talk is to be, give uh, a brief overview of um, pretty much what uh, we are doing at what DNA classification means. So we can start by um, looking at the process uh, from end-to-end uh, -end of uh, DNA classification. In particular, 
uh, our goal is uh, uh, to take uh, DNA sequences which are extracted from a soup, and it's a uh, picture one over here. Um, and this soup is uh, typically collected by setting a malaise trap uh, in uh, the wood, so some type of collection methods. You um, collect a bunch of samples from uh, uh, from an insect trap, and then you um, basically um, wait there for one week, and then after one week, uh, pretty much you get results that messy and uh, uh, all corrupted. So it's impossible to do morphological recognitions of the insect species captured, and so we need some automatic and fast method to understand and extract all the species that we've captured. This is, of course, uh, um, to assess biodiversity. Now, step two and three is basically the high throughput sequencing of DNA sequences, which means that from this soup, we go to uh, have a sequence of ACG and T. And then the last step of our taxonomic classification is literally to find a label, uh, in this case is Microbisium parvulum, which means that uh, I need to find an insect, uh, from one insect I get a DNA sequence and then I get a label. And this label is multi-layer, meaning that we can start at the kingdom and going down to the phylum class and up to the species. So eventually we want to place and know the exact taxonomy of, our, uh, of all of our insect species. Now, uh, the first question is how can we, first of all, treat DNA sequences at, uh, in the first place? So we want to have uh, different classification methods or several classification methods, but the first step is let's treat these uh, uh, sequences as uh, predictors. And in particular, there are cert several ways in which we can do this. The first one is uh, we can simply take two sequences and uh, look at the pairwise similarities. So, um, for example, we can count the number uh, two sequences in the same position uh, have uh, an equal nucleotide over the total uh, length of the sequence if uh, these two sequences are aligned, or we can find for some uh, alignment, local alignment type of algorithm that uh, ensures uh, positional comparability, and then we can actually compute our, uh, our similarity. Another thing that's uh, very common in the classification method is uh, take, looking at the K-mer decomposition. That is uh, just uh, fix a width of uh, length K and then count the number of times uh, a subword or a subsequence. So, for example, AAA, AAC, where K equals four, appears in the sequence. And uh, we can treat like uh, K-mer species appearance, uh, K-mer appearance or uh, K-mer frequencies as one of our predictors. And uh, the last thing is that we can even, uh, if the sequences are aligned, look at uh, uh, the A, C, G, and T as categorical features, literally. So um, we can even treat them as, uh, um, as, a, as, a, as a simple category and uh, even fit them inside uh, a random forest. This will give actually a, a pretty nice result. Um, the goal that uh, we uh, are currently having is to um, compare the performances of different taxonomic classifications uh, method under certain uh, uh, under certain uh, uh, under certain setups that uh, I will explain by now. But uh, the way in which uh, typically um, taxonomic classifier works is uh, by just taking the DNA sequence structure, we can have uh, uh, different rules. So, for example, we can start with simple heuristics where no training is required. And there is a very famous algorithm called the syntax, which is very, very fast. And then just like uh, takes the camera decomposition and count uh, and selects the sequence that has the number of uh, the highest number of shared cameras between our query and our library. Our library is clearly the train set of label sequences. Then uh, we can have naive Bayes classification, and uh, one very, very famous algorithm is called RDP, uh, which uh, is basically, uh, again, uses the Kamer decomposition uh, and the product of presence, subs, and probabilities. This has roughly 11,000 citations, is, is one of the most used in the, in the literature. Uh, I am personally, uh, with uh, my advisor David Danson and uh, uh, Thomas Origon, who's a professor at uh, uh, Bicocca are developing uh, uh, another naive Bayes algorithm called Bayesant. Bayesant stands for Bayesian Non-Parametric Taxonomic Classifier. And uh, the advantage of Bayesant is that uh, we want to recognize uh, 
new species as well. And this is a problem that I will talk about uh, in the next few slides. We also have uh, similarity based models and uh, Protax uh, developed by uh, Panus Muervo and also, also Vaskainen uh, is uh, one uh, nice example. And basically, we can have a multinomial regression over uh, the similarities um, that uses the similarities as predictors. And we can also have more modern approaches like deep learning. Uh, actually, there is a recent algorithm by uh, Wu et al. in 2020 that uh, uses convolutional neural network uh, to the KMR decomposition. So the structure that we can Im impose uh, to our classifier is quite uh, vast and there are many choices possible. So considering uh, uh, this uh, wide variety, our goal is actually to benchmark them under different scenarios and see which one performs better under uh, particular uh, and under which setup. Now, the workflow is actually uh, pretty simple. We have our query sequences uh, in here, which are unlabeled. We feed them into our taxonomic classification algorithm. And this algorithm actually takes on a library, which is basically a training set that's divided across several levels. So at the first level, we have some macro uh, taxa uh, like the butterfly here and uh, the B-type uh, tax taxa. And then, uh, of course, like taxonomies are uh, uh, trees. And so we can go down to the class level, for example, and we see some differentiation like that typically, historically is uh, um, dependent by morphology. Uh, the recent development of uh, DNA barcoding are actually uh, going off from uh, pure morphology. But uh, in this case, uh, we, we, you see that we have some type of differentiation that is also refined whenever we look at the order level. Now, at the order level, also I placed also my DNA sequences, which are in my model at least uh, placed at the leaf of uh, the taxonomic tree. So our goal is to take the information from this library, use it in our taxonomic classification and return some um, uh, some uh, um, predicted values, for example, this red DNA is a is this red butterfly predicted with nine, uh, 0 0.98 per, 0 0.98 probability, and uh, so on and so forth. The um, biggest uh, problem in this type of uh, classification is that uh, uh, oftentimes libraries, which are basically our train set, are not really do not really look like this, but look like this, which means that uh, there are uh, many cases in which uh, we might find that these sequences belong to unknown branches in the taxonomy. And what does this mean? It, it is estimated that roughly 5 million more insects uh, are awaiting uh, uh, either um, discovery, so they are unknown to science, or they uh, are simply uh, not uh, classified through in a, in a library. So they don't have a reference DNA sequence, unlike uh, the species uh, down here. So we might have that whenever we go out in the wilderness and we set our traps, we do our high throughput sequences, sequencing, and we have our little uh, uh, sequences, we predict them, we might find certain species that have not been cataloged or, or that are not cataloged within our library. And we can have this at many levels in the hierarchy. We can have, for example, a new uh, class within an existing phylum, a new order within an existing class, or we can even have uh, an entirely new phylum. So in this case, for example, the algorithm is predicting an entirely new phylum with probability 0.7 because we have a, a black a DNA sequence here that does not appear in the data set. So our goal is actually to uh, understand how the different classification methods work under these uh, unknown scenarios. That is, uh, whenever the label of the test sequence is not uh, uh, observed in the training set. So basically, this is a problem of incomplete libraries, and our strategy is uh, to test these uh, scenarios is by employing different types of uh, um, uh, train and test splitting. So one thing that uh, is very common in machine learning is to, to train algorithms, is to take our uh, uh, set and split it between train, train and test. And this split is typically done at random, so the, the 
composition of the test set or the distribution of the test set is approximately equal to the distribution of the train set. Now, in this case, we call this we call this case actually split on sequences because we have uh, uh, literally the rows in our uh, in our library are DNA sequences, and so by taking or subsetting the rows at random, we pretty much have something that's uh, um, something that pretty that we have that the structure of the two sets actually are pretty similar. Uh, in the split on taxa, instead, we can have some more uh, stratified type of sample. And so we first select a taxon and then we uh, take one sequence from that taxon. So the idea is that uh, the two in this last case, the distribution of the train and the test are different. And we want to see uh, how the algorithms perform. Uh, we use uh, in particular a data set that uh, is, uh, recently came out. Uh, thanks to the work of Panu and Thomas Roslin and uh, 90 other uh, um, morphologists and uh, scientists in Finland. This is called FINBOL and uh, stands for Finnish Barcode of Life. It's roughly uh, a reference library of uh, 35,000 uh, uh, sequences, which are all aligned. And uh, it's, uh, it's distributed across seven levels with uh, uh, 11,000 actually distinct species at the lowest level. Uh, to see some contest, here is what the library looks like. We have five main biggest or, uh, big orders, Lepidoptera, Hymenoptera, Coleoptera, Diptera, and also uh, Arane. And uh, what you see here is pairwise DNA similarities within, uh, the, uh, within the library. So we have uh, some uh, nice properties of the Lepidoptera order, which means that they are super uh, correlated and they are uh, not much correlated with uh, um, the rest, uh, whereas, uh, uh, for example, Diptera and Coleoptera show uh, a very cross similarity, which might be, um, which might alter the performance of our algorithm. Instead, in uh, part B, we have uh, uh, train and test composition under the two different types of split, and you see that uh, the blue part here is uh, the sequence, the labels that appear only on the test set. So clearly in the first case, we have pretty much uh, uh, that we observe almost every label, whereas in this split on taxa, we have a lot of unknown branches in the taxonomy. So we run our models under different uh, type of, uh, um, under these two settings. And uh, in here, you see the probabilities, uh, the, the accuracy and the cumulative probability of predicting uh, the species level under the two different uh, splits. And roughly what we see here is that uh, pretty much the algorithms, which are completely different in nature, do a very, very similar job. So for example, RDP does 83%, uh, CNN does 82%. So the, the spirit of these two algorithms is completely different. One is naive base, the other one is convolutional neural network, uh, but their performance is uh, very comparable. Uh, it is uh, uh, actually um, uh, Bayesian and uh, and uh, uh, and Protax actually do a little better on the split on taxa because they are designed uh, to account also for uh, this unknown species problem, uh, whereas CNN, RDP, and Syntax are not. But overall, the, the performance of, of the algorithms are uh, pretty much uh, similar. So uh, this leads to some conclusion that is. Uh, uh, even if we are looking at uh, different strategies, uh, and uh, of course uh, these algorithms have a different uh, uh, allocation, uh, memory allocation, different speed, and different process. If the library is uh, actually well uh, um, labeled and there is enough uh, uh, differentiation between the sequences, and it is sort of the case of the Fingal library, we still have very, very similar performances irrespective of uh, the irrespective of the algorithm. Um, Protax and Bayesian uh, are specifically designed to incorporate new uh, taxonomies, so they will predict whether there is a new tax or not at some given level. But these uh, new taxonomies are, uh, of course, dependent on the context. There are contexts in which it uh, makes perfect sense to treat the discovered labeled as effectively a new species. There are others in, in which uh, instead uh, you want to um, 
treat these uh, new species as some uh, uh, error uh, within, when, uh, whenever you do um, high throughput sequencing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, convolutional neural network RDP and syntax, uh, they do not account for unobserved species, but uh, the next step uh, is to design some type of uh, way to incorporate uh, uh, these uh, new species appearance. And one thing that uh, can be done, for example, is to find an optimal probability cutoff below which uh, you basically disregard the sequence and say this has been predicted, with, this taxon has been predicted with very low probability, so we don't trust this uh, classification, and so we treat it as, uh, uh, as a new uh, species or uh, some sequencing error. So uh, what, which algorithm to use is strictly data dependent, and um, this is pretty much uh, uh, it for my presentation. Uh, and here are the references in case you in case you're wondering. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander, for a very, very interesting talk. Okay. It was very clear for our uh, for, for people who are not very okay. <laughs> into it also. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So now we have a couple of minutes for questions and comments, and then we have a coffee break. Uh, Kari posted, Kari Lahti posted a uh, link for the products. Yes. Web page to the chat if somebody is interested. Nico India. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for the great presentation. Uh, I have a question about the like imbalance in the data sets. Yes. And uh, how does the like algorithms that you have tested, do they take to account the like I guess some species have more of the DNA in the uh, soup than others. So is this a problem and how do you, how do these algorithms work with it? Okay, uh, there is a, uh, it's the, the way in which you handle uh, imbalance uh, is strictly dependent on, uh, uh, of course, the algorithm. So I can give an example of how uh, my algorithm works and it's just, uh, uh, selecting a kernel for uh, each uh, leaf in the tree. So uh, each leaf contains all the DNA sequences and uh, having more sequences uh, at the lowest level, so an imbalanced data set means that you're going to have more information on uh, uh, the lowest node. Uh, and uh, so in this case, uh, you uh, have uh, a better prediction in this sense. Uh, the imbalance also um, can be dealt with uh, um, specifying a prior probability, so the prior probability over uh, um, uh, over each uh, taxon at, at each level. And uh, in, in Bayesian, at least, uh, you have uh, uh, a thing called uh, pitman yor which is a uh, Bayesian non-parametric uh, method that uh, pretty much uh, selects these probabilities by uh, accounting for the possibility of a new species, but uh, it can also boil down to just taking uh, nj over n, where nj is the frequency of uh, uh, one given taxon, over n, which is the total number of sequences. So this is a way to, to account for unbalance. There are uh, uh, other ways, uh, for example, Protax uh, trains the algorithm uh, by uh, subsetting the reference sequence library and then computing the similarities. And this uh, uh, subset uh, actually is uh, done by using prior information. So uh, it's a strictly algorithm dependent in case, in case uh, I, I hope this uh, answers the questions. I see there are, there are others in the chat, so. Um, okay. Uh, where the method used, uh, you supervise or unsupervised approach. Okay, so uh, most of them are actually supervised, uh, except for syntax, which is sort of unsupervised in a sense that it does not really require training, is pure heuristic, and this for this reason is like super, super fast. Um, there is uh, not much difference though between syntax and uh, uh, the other algorithms that we have uh, we've tested. What we are learning is that it's more a problem of uh, 
quality of the data rather than uh, approach, which is like quite interesting. Um, there is no algorithm that does uh, overwhelmingly better uh, than, than the other ones. And uh, if like some simple heuristic does uh, exactly as a convolutional neural network, then it means that it, it is a problem of uh, uh, either differentiation between the, the sequences or uh, um, careful annotation. Uh, if you have worked with multi as watch approach is more appropriate uh, for DNA data in your experience. Um, so in this particular setting, uh, for me, uh, the supervised approach is the way to go, simply because you, want, you have a library of references and you have DNA sequences that come from uh, the environment and you want to locate them. So you need to be supervised. Uh, you need to be supervised also because you want to assess biodiversity. There is another branch, however, uh, in the DNA sequences literature, so-called, so which instead takes uh, uh, some uh, set of DNA sequences and reconstructs the phylogenetic tree. So what is their uh, ancestors and how their mutation actually uh, happened. But this is not uh, uh, what is um, interesting for us because we are actually just trying to assess biodiversity or trying to predict individual taxonomy. So eventually, and there is some work in this uh, sense, uh, reconciling the phylogenetic approach and uh, reconciling the taxonomic approach is uh, one big goal that you can have because essentially you can produce two very, very different trees. One is more of a clustering method and one is a given uh, and historical uh, clusters that come from uh, years and years of classification, and uh, you want basically to reconcile them, and they might give even the very, very different results. Um, is th if there are no questions, then uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Ale. Okay. That's interesting. I think we will now have the coffee break for 10 minutes, and we will convene back at 15 past two for another set of talks, but you can sure continue the discussion in chat and in the discussion part in the in the end of, of the day. OK, so see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a chance to have a cup of coffee or other refreshments. We are ready to start the next set of talks very soon. OK, so there are some new people who joined in and now we are ready to start. Our first speaker in this session is Laura Ruotsalainen, who is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science in the University of, of Helsinki. And the title is Deep Learning Based Modeling for Sustainability. So please, Laura. So thank you and hello, everyone. I'm, I'm trying to share the correct slide here. So I guess now it is visible. Just trying to get it also to the presentation mode. Yes, we can see it, but we can also see the little slice on the. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm trying for some reason. It's not very easy to put it on there. OK, so now I guess you can see the presentation mode also. Yes. Yeah, OK, good. So, so hello, everyone. So as I said, so uh, I'm an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Helsinki, and I'm going today talk a bit uh, first uh, in general about how uh, artificial intelligence actually is, is helping uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals. And especially when I'm talking about artificial intelligence, I'm, I'm then talking about machine learning. And, and then when talking about our own research, then, then also especially as about deep learning. But, but yes, I'm at the university, I'm, I'm leading a research group called Space So Temporal Data Analysis. And, and as I said, so our goal is to, to then develop methods for achieving the, the benefits for sustainability science. And we have quite a big research group at the moment, and, and we are working uh, for creating methods for smart cities and especially for traffic, mobility, and autonomous systems. And the spatial temporal data, in our case, it means that we are uh, developing methods for both obtaining accurate and reliable navigation data and then using this navigation data then to benefit the development of smart cities and, and autonomous systems. And in addition to, to being a professor of, of the Department of Computer Science, I'm also a professor of Helsinki Institute of Sustainability Science, so HELSUS. So there comes the, the very strong sustainability science viewpoint. And then also I'm a steering group member of Finnish uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence. So, so then really strongly now connecting the sustainability research into the artificial intelligence research also. And as I said, we are quite a big group at the moment, so if you're interested, you can also find more about our research for using this link here. But then first, a bit in, in general about using artificial intelligence for, for sustainability. And then there was really interesting uh, paper uh, published just last year in Nature Communications, where the authors had made really a detailed analysis of how do then artificial intelligence methods really contribute for achieving these sustainable development goals. And as you know, there are 17 sustainable development goals then addressing all the different pillars of sustainability. So of course the environmental, but then also the social and economic aspects of sustainability. And then based on their analysis, they did find that uh, of the 17 sub sustainable development goals and, and uh, those uh, 169 uh, sub targets, AI did enable 134 and then was seen as inhibitor for 59 of, of the goals. And then what is interesting is that especially for then achieving the, the climate uh, goals, their artificial intelli intelligence was in very important role. And of course, this partly comes from the fact that when we are using artificial intelligence and, and machine learning computer vision, we are able then to uh, both um, uh, sense and, and um, detect what is happening in the world, but we are also able to develop models that we can use for simulating what, what do different phenomena, how do they affect uh, the world, and, and for example, what do our new novel uh, uh, res resolutions, or how do we want to resolve the problems, how do they then affect the, the world and the climate without really intervening in those operations. 
But what we uh, do really need to, to then get uh, the, the climate change uh, stopped and, and, and to, to really achieve these great sustainability goals, we, we do need uh, sustainability transformations. And then for those, we need to make big systemic changes where also I can see that artificial intelligence and then machine learning are very important parts of and, and the um, uh, sustainable transformation, so the systemic change that our group is working very heavily towards is, is the traffic and mobility. Because at the moment we can see that the, the situation with the present uh, transportation is, is not very good from the sustainability viewpoint. So, for example, every year there is more than one million road traffic cause deaths per year uh, globally and, and 10 million people injured. And then most of these uh, accidents are caused by a driver error. So we could see that that when we would give some of, of the uh, perception and, and decision tasks for, for example, for uh, computers, we could get uh, reduced uh, big portion of those. So of course, and also the, the transportation is, is really a big reason for green, greenhouse gas emissions. So, so something must be done there too. And, and then also at the moment, so, so the transportation doesn't really provide equal opportunities for all people in, in the globe. And then for that, for example, autonomous driving would also give great benefits. And, and how are we then in practice addressing these problems? So, so now trying to make the transportation to be more sustainable. So, so we were uh, granted a, a project by the Academy of Finland last year. Uh, together with, with two colleagues from this Helsinki uh, Institute for Sustainability Science, Helsus. So we are in the project, we are working to, to trying to now fuse or merge uh, climate, uh, social and computer sciences. So meaning that we are looking at the air quality aspects coming, arising from the, the transportation, different kinds of transportation decisions, and also then looking at how do the livability of the city, so how, how does the different transportation decisions affect and the, the social, social aspects in the cities. And as I said, so we, we are now developing novel deep learning methods then to, to uh, optimize the traffic in the cities based on what is the effect on the air quality and also the livability of the cities. And, and how are we then doing this? So, so we are now developing a deep learning method called reinforcement learning, where we are then having different kind of like agents and we are simulating the cities and then optimizing the traffic and, and then seeing how do then these different decisions, how do they affect then the air quality? So what kind of emissions do we get there? And, and then at the same time, we are then mo uh, modeling. So how do these different uh, traffic uh, decisions? So for example, what kind of traffic there is in the city? How much space do we give for, for the uh, pedestrians and bicycles and, and so on? How do they then affect on the livability of the cities, what kind of like demographic uh, uh, features do the people have who live in, this, in these city areas, for example, and then how does that affect for the number of private vehicles they might have. And, and then to be able then to, to optimize this system, we of course then also must uh, uh, model how the traffic behaves. So we are looking at, at different uh, characteristics uh, for the traffic. So we are looking, for example, how the weather affects the traffic, uh, what different events, how do they affect the amount of, of vehicles that there are in the traffic, and for example, how do they then different accidents affect the number of, of the vehicles in the area. And then, of course, from the number of the vehicles, we are then able to, to again, uh, introduce this information into the air quality modeling and then also to the modeling of the socioeconomic data and the livability of the cities. And it, when we are doing this reinforcement learning modeling, we are then uh, trying to find a, a joint so-called reward function. So we want to then find the rules, how should we balance these different aspects so that we can really find the, the best optimized solution when looking at, at three, all these three different aspects. And, and then the goal of, of the project is to provide then the city planners a tool how they can then in the future plan for the future cities. 
So then uh, how in practice we are also then then addressing this problem is that of course uh, the air quality, for example, the, the uh, motion of, of the air, it, it is affected by the city uh, 3D model. So how high the buildings are and how they are built around the environment. So we are using simulators. We have a car traffic simulator that we are using then at, at uh, introducing there the, the model of a certain city area that we have decided to be used as a basis for our modeling. And, and then here we are then now uh, generating the, the modeled data flow and then looking at, at its effect on, on the uh, air quality in the surroundings. And also, I said, it, it's not actually a very easy task even to, to really model and, and forecast how the traffic flow goes based on these different factors that I also was describing, the weather and events and the accidents. So this has, of course, been done a lot also in, in previous research, but not really all these different characteristics have been addressed before. And, and therefore, we are here using a, a deep learning uh, model called long short term memory network. And then this kind of like network is, is at the moment the state of the art network for then also introducing the temporal domain for modeling the data. And then here you can see some, some uh, initial results out from this modeling. So we are able to train the network quite well to then follow also the, the real traffic flow at, the, at this area and with these different characteristics. So in, in addition now to the research that we are doing in, in our research group, we are also, as said, in the FK, the Finnish Center for Artificial Intelligence, we are now really strongly also introducing the sustainability viewpoint for the artificial intelligence research there. And, and one uh, task for that has been now the uh, introduction of, of new so-called FKI highlight, which is called a Artificial Intelligence for Sustainability, where we are now, now really looking at the research already ongoing at, at the FKI and then trying to find how we can use that research for then also benefiting the sustainability science. And, and one part of, of the, uh, uh, sorry, the highlight is also the uh, creation of so-called virtual laboratory, where we are also then continuing uh, simulations of the, the different traffic decisions. And, and here, it definitely then also addressing the autonomous driving. And then there are also two big tasks then to be addressed. And one of those is so-called closing the reality gap. So meaning that when we are simulating some big systematic um, topic, so, so then there is quite big gap of introducing those into the real world implementation. And, and this is something that we are now trying to, to close. And, and then also the other big topic is, is that how are we then able to fuse all these different uh, simulation information to then get this fused optimization results. And then here, in addition to addressing this air quality and socioeconomical topics that we were talking or, or we are addressing in our um, previous project, we are also then now looking at the CO2 emissions and then looking at how the, the climate change can be uh, stopped by that. But that was all that I, I had prepared for this. So, so thank you. Thank you, Laura. Very interesting talk. And now time for questions and comments. The floor is yours. Can't see any hands, and uh, there was no questions on the chat. Okay, well, thank you. Some thanks. Yeah, Eero, Eero has something. Well, uh, this is maybe not a question. I did, I was so slow, I couldn't uh, see the LSTM prediction for the traffic prediction. So, can you show that figure again? Yes. Uh, yeah, here. Okay, can you still see it? I I guess I'm still sharing that. Okay, can you see that slide? No. 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 Okay. Uh -huh. 
did I stop sharing then? Okay, I'll, I'll take that back. Here, now you probably see it. Yes, now yeah. we can. Okay, good, yeah. So, so, so did you have some question related to that or? No, I was just uh, surprised that the uh, long term prediction was so accurate. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is actually really good. And, and of course, now arising from from using these LSTM networks that also kind of like they, they do this so-called recurrent uh, use of the data. So, so they are looking at the historical data also. So the, or, or kind of like looking at, at the previous epochs and just the ones that they are predicting. And, and this is, uh, as I said, so, so for, for this spatial temporal data, this is the, the state of the art method to be used just because it's not kind of like looking at, at only certain aspects, like for example, the CNNs that are looking only for the spatial te uh, kind of like domain of the data, but this is also taking the temporal domain into account. Okay, if there are if there are no other questions or comments, I think we can let the other Laura yes. give her talk. Thank you. Laura Uusitalo is our next speaker from Syke, leading researcher, and the title is Dynamic Bayesian Networks in Environmental Change Research. So please. Thank you. Can you see my slides now? Yeah. Cool. So yeah. My name is Laura Usitalo. I'm, I'm from Suke. And um, last time I think Otto was kind of was saying that we didn't have so many like modeling type of work. So now we've been having more modeling related work also in the seminar. And I'm presenting one um, application using dynamic Bayesian networks to to try to figure out whether the environment is changing. So I will just cover quickly the background, like why environmental change is a research challenge and uh, what are dynamic Bayesian networks and then um, some basics and highlights of our research. So basically, we try to understand um, ecosystem functioning by creating conceptual mathematical models that describe the relationships between the ecosystem components like um, in this case, like how temperature nutrients affect the plankton and how the how, how the fish species are eating the plankton and each, each other and how humans are um, fishing the fish and so on. And we use uh, time series data to uh, to look at these things. But what if the relationships change within the time series that we are looking at? So, um, oops. For example, um, imagine this kind of a predator prey time series. This is just toy data now, this is not real. But we can plot the data quite nicely. So you can see that when there are more predators, there will be less of the prey species. OK, so, the, so there's, there's some kind of function that we describe by, by the linear function, the linear line there. But maybe actually, some of this data comes from the early years in our time series and some others come from the late later uh, years in our time series and actually there are two different functions that would describe this system much better so in the in the early years we are here on the blue line the relationship has been stronger and in the later years there's some effect that has made this relationship weaker while it still exists like the, the prey response uh, less strongly to the predator uh, abundance, for example. So uh, this may be caused by something that we don't have in our data. There might be a, an ecosystem component or a biogeochemical process that we don't have any data on, but it's, it's affecting uh, the system and this change um, is a result of that. And uh, we can't add that as a variable in our model because we don't have data. And this, this kind of um, changes is something that we try to 
capture with hidden variables or latent variables in our, our models. So, so this hidden or latent variable means that we don't know what it is. We don't have any data on it, but we think they might be a process. And we try to model it nevertheless. So uh, just very briefly, uh, Bayesian networks are probabilistic, fully probabilistic models. Like here on the upper left hand corner is a very simple for a uh, variable version network. It's a fully probabilistic models that are usually or often built to describe the causal interactions, like something is causing something else or affecting something else in the system. Then we have some other um, a hidden Markov model. On the upper right hand corner, it's, it's kind of a model of a time series where um, we have some observations like for example we um we have an observation of how many bees there are in the meadow every year and we know that actually the the amount of bees depends on the bee uh, community dynamics for example but we don't have a measure of that so basically the hidden variable here is is the true process that is in the nature but we also only observe the um our observations, our B counts, for example. So um, the true process is hidden. And when we kind of com combine these concepts, we have a dynamic Bayesian network with hidden variables. So um, we can make the Bayesian network dynamic by um, adding time slides, if you wish, like one year time slices or maybe one day time slices, whatever. And then we add these hidden variables that we don't observe but we think there is some factor that affects or may affect the system. And, and that will affect also the uh, variables in the variables that we can observe. So here on the uh, down right hand corner, uh, the, we have a dynamic Bayesian network with hidden variables. And this is basically what we've done here in this work. Um, running through two papers that have been published in Sorry, Laura, did your presentation freeze? OK, so it looks like Laura has some problems with the connections and is perhaps trying to reconnect soon. Okay, it looks like I've been cut off. But you are back now, great. Well, I'll try and continue. Um, where, where, where did you la lose me? Wait, when did I stop drop? Uh, you had the maps of uh, archipelago C. Okay, cool. Regions. Baltic Sea, all right. Um, 
So it would be like, just a second. It'd be like this map. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So we were modeling the food web of the central Baltic Sea that's kind of shaded there. And it's it's a rather simple ecosystem, not so many species around and even less species that we have data on. And we built this kind of model to uh, describe the dynamics of the key players in the system that we have data on again. Um, it looks really messy and don't worry about it, but it, it only has a few uh, zooplankton uh, taxa, three fish species called Pratt and Herring, and some uh, biogeochemical variables and some um, juvenile stages of the fish. And we have one year time steps and then we, we fit you this and, and we have hidden variables that I didn't draw here. But basically the hidden variables are, have the potential to affect or look at each one of these variables here. So the idea here is basically that if we observe a change during the time series that we have in our um, the 30 year time series that we have in our model, uh, if the relationships like like we have the linear, the line there in, in in the earlier slide, uh, the relationship might be something else as well. But if we, if that changes during the time series, then that should basically be uh, kind of captured and explained away by the hidden variable. And when the hidden variable is linked to all of these variables in this model, um, it kind of observes the absorbs the variance or the error from each of these. So basically, if there is no no kind of uh, consistent change in the system, our hidden variable time series should be just white noise, more or less. It should be like it should vary some to some amount, but not too much, and there shouldn't be any clear trend or change. But if many of these or, or one of these changes really strongly, or many of these uh, change in concert, they may some may, may increase, some may decrease, but anyway, if they change in um, at the same time, approximately, we should observe a corresponding trend in the hidden variable time series. And this is what I'm going to show you next. Again, uh, we had three in, in the first part of the work, we had three different models. One with just one like generic hidden variable, one hidden variable linked to everything in the model. Um, another one that had two hidden variables, one for the zooplankton and one for the fish. And a third one that had all of these. So let's take a look at that. Look at the um, hidden variable time series. And this is what you have up here on the, on the left upper hand corner. You have this model with only one generic hidden variable, and we can see a strong change in the hidden variable time series in the like 80. 81 to 1990 or so, 1991. And this is basically, uh, we know that there's been this regime shift in the Baltic Sea where the, where the food webs and the ecosystem changed quite a lot. So this is what we capture also with, with the hidden variable. Um, the other figures on the left, middle and right, they are the models that had the, um, the clue paid. So the herring and sprat, those are the small fish that eat zooplankton. Uh, their time series, and then the code uh, hidden variable time series. And we can see that there's much more kind of uncertainty or noise here in the hidden variable time series. But we can maybe see that the uh, increase here takes place in both of these uh, hidden variables. The decrease that we can see in the end of the time series in the, in the generic hidden variable it is probably caused by code because we can see it strongly down here, but not so much in the clue page. OK, then we have the, uh, the third model that had both the generic hidden variable and clue page and code hidden variables, all three. And basically the same story is repeated more or less here. Um, in the other part of the work we experimented, I'm going to rush through because I know I'm a bit over time already. <laughs> um, we experimented with changing the model structures and also with uh, looking at the time, like if we 
if we have only short time, ser time series and then uh, when we add more and more data, what happens? Or if we take a sliding moving window with the data, what happens then? And basically, sorry to rush, but basically um, what we found here is that this methodology, we we managed to identify the regime shift that we know was is there or that. So that's kind of positive, but it's it's not groundbreaking. Um, but we can also uh, using the like multiple hidden variables that are linked to different parts of the ecosystem in the model. We can kind of pinpoint where the change happens at which which part of the time series and where the change is stronger and where, where it's weaker. So I think that's interesting in a sense. And um, when we when we use the models to predict, there are two stories. Maybe one is that um, don't predict with these models. It's, it's hugely uncertain, which is kind of makes sense because the system is very, very complex and it has a lot of moving parts and also a lot of like uncertainty from models point of view. So um, we, we can't really predict very far to the future, um, but also at the different model setups, like how exactly you decide to to model the system, it doesn't really matter so much. Some of the models were slightly better than the others, but the big picture is that the exact model setup doesn't affect, which I think is a good thing because we can never model the system like the complete system in a in a way that would be like very true to the ecosystem. And we always need to make decisions and uh, make simplifications. So I think it's a good news that we it doesn't really matter what kind of simpli simpli simplifications we make if they are basically like ecologically uh, reasonable. And the last point is, is not surprising to anybody, I guess, but more data and you predict better. <laughs> uh, thank you and, and sorry for the technical trouble. Not at all. Many thanks for you, Laura, for your nice presentation. Any questions or comments for Laura? Unless there aren't any, then we can give the floor for yet another Laura. Yes, the next speaker is Laura Kaikkonen, a researcher from University of Helsinki and also affiliated with HELCOM. And the topic is Bayesian Networks for Environmental Risk Assessment. Please, Laura. Yes, thank you. I'll try to manage. Can you see the correct version of? Not the yeah, we can, we can see Great. some version anyway. OK, some presentation. OK, that yeah, would be yeah. mine. <laughs> um, hold on. Did I did it load it now? Stop, stop saying. Can you still see it? Yes, we can. OK, my my view just changed. No problem. Then. OK, so um, sorry about that. And thank you for the kind invitation to join you today. Today I'll be talking about the application of some of these tools in evaluating the risks of human activities on the environment. And I'll be focusing on the more practical sides of using Bayesian networks in environmental risk assessments and some reasons why I found them useful in the context of my own research, which deals with the impacts of new kinds of human activities on the marine environment. Right, so the motivation for this study draws on the fact that economic development and human activities in the oceans are accelerating rapidly which is introducing the seas and oceans to a new phase of large-scale industrialization. This expansion of ocean-based activities is encompassed through both the expansion of existing, more traditional ocean uses, such as fisheries, tourism and maritime transport activities, but it's also giving room to a lot of emerging industries, such as bioprospecting, new forms of offshore energy and use of sea floor minerals. This increasing number of activities in the ocean is resulting in multiple effects to the environment with often uncertain consequences. While we do have data and evidence on the effects of many individual activities in isolation, the unprecedented rate of developments in the marine realm, coupled with other kinds of stresses such as climate change, 
further adds to the complexity of these risks, and these are often really hard to predict. And this is particularly true for new kinds of activities where there is no previous evidence of what the impacts to the environment are, and hence no data, which adds yet another layer to the uncertainties. So thinking of environmental impacts in terms of risks is one way to deal with these uncertainties. Environmental risk assessment is a process for estimating the probability and magnitude of the effects of human activities on the environment, with an overall aim to try to evaluate different possible outcomes to try to guide governance and management actions. This figure here broadly summarizes the multitude of ways that we can think about different kinds of envir environmental risks, showing the linkages between human activities, potential changes in ecosystems, and further connecting these to the human societies. So one could always say that you can apply a risk assessment thinking into any of these linkages, or indeed to any unwanted event or activity. Unfortunately, most currently used methods for looking at environmental risks are qualitative or at best semi-quantitative. Some of you may be familiar with this kind of risk assessment matrices, which are essentially just another way to deal with qualitative metrics that do not fully describe the different possible outcomes following external disturbances, nor do they account for the uncertainty associated with these different estimates. As such, current risk assessment procedures don't really translate very well when we need to think about policy or conservation targets. So to rethink how we usually evaluate these risks, Bayesian networks offer, offer a quite a useful tool for this. As we just heard from Laura, uh, Bayesian networks are a type of graphical causal model where the nodes, so the variables, represent random variables and the arcs between them represent probabilistic dependencies between these variables. And in an environmental risk assessment context, the cool thing about Bayesian networks is that they explicitly handle cause and effect through the connection between the nodes. And the connections are based on probabilities instead of just simple scores. So uncertainty is explicitly accounted for. Bayesian networks can be used to integrate different kinds of knowledge from expert opinion to data. So they're pretty well suited for cases where very little data are available, as prior information can be updated as more data becomes available. In my own research, I have particularly been looking at the environmental impacts of seabed mining. This is one activity in the marine realm that does not commercially occur yet. So the aim of my research has been to try to combine evidence from different sources to try to predict what the impacts to marine ecosystems could be. And to formulate a predictive risk assessment with almost no data, uh, we developed a two-phased approach for modeling, which consisted of first interviews with experts to build the model and get an overview of the risks. And secondly, quantitative probabilistic modeling, which sort of includes the model parameterization. When defined manually by experts, a Bayesian network illustrates the imagined causal connections in the system. So in the first part of the work, we defined the model structure with expert in semi-structured interviews, which we held as a series of workshops and did this as a so-called causal mapping exercise, simply just asking experts which parameters affect what. And these interviews resulted in this big causal map, which summarizes all the different kinds of connections and environmental impacts that seabed mining could have in the Baltic Sea. And this massive network then serves as a basis for looking into the impacts in more detail. And we use this network to actually develop a Bayesian network to provide us quantitative estimates of the ecological consequences of these activities under different scenarios. And because there are a fair number of connections in our bigger causal map, we decided to quantify first only a submodel of this complete causal network and focus only on certain kinds of species. The second and maybe more laborious part of the work consists of parameterizing the model, so estimating the magnitude of ecosystem impacts through probability estimates. What this means is that each of the arrows in the causal network will be assigned a conditional probability 
so that the values of the so-called parent node will affect the outcomes of the child node. And in this figure is an example to get an idea of what these conditional probabilities look like. So say that we want to estimate how does the biomass of some selected group of organisms, here filter feeders, change under different levels of suspended sediment. So this table here describes how the probability distribution of the biomass change uh, varies with changing levels of sedimentation, which is the stressor that we're looking at. And the practical thing is that these probabilities can be drawn from different sources, including learning them from numerical data, if any are available. And in this case, we would consider ourselves lucky. Um, we can use literature to formulate these probability distributions or rely on expert assessment if no data are available. And the quantification of these networks is truly often the big task as the conditional probabilities must be defined for all the different combinations of the variable states. We often have information on only a particular configuration of variable states, which gives us an idea of the effect of pressures in isolation. But to look at different scenarios, we also need to address how these different variables interact, which exponentially increases the size of these probability tables. So the more variables you have affecting one variable, the larger your distributions have to be and more data are needed or information really. But a great thing about Bayesian networks is that the fund does not need to uh, stop at one study because Bayesian networks are sort of modular models. Uh, it's fairly easy to combine multiple networks which supports iterative model development and you can have several teams, for example, working on different submodels based on their expertise. And in the context of environmental impacts, it's possible, for instance, to first define the effects for separate time steps and then to have separate models for accounting for spatial aspects, first starting with a discrete area and then further adding spatial layers to have at the end of the day a full uh, environmental impacts or risk assessment. And what these kind of risk assessments can contribute to is trying to evaluate and see the uncertainties and knowledge gaps related to the impacts of different kinds of human activities. So while quantification of this kind of probabilistic models is a lot of work, doing already this kind of synthesis helps illustrate what is the current state of knowledge on the impacts, because it is equally important to express what we don't know than what we do when we're working with big, big amounts of data. So if we're able to put numbers on the impacts instead of using qualitative descriptors, maybe this can be more useful for informing management and policy. So in conclusion, Bayesian networks offer a number of useful attributes for environmental risk assessments. They can serve as a scenario synthesis tool for evaluating multiple outcomes even the unlikely ones. They serve for integrating knowledge from multiple sources to build the model structure. And these models can also be parametricized from data and expert assessment and allow combining these two. And finally, both, both the model components and the parameters can be updated quite easily with new information and data, which supports iterative model building. And in my work, I have mainly used R for uh, doing all this work. So there's some recommended reading and very good examples if someone is keen on seeing how Bayesian networks work with R applications. Thank you thank very much you, for listening. And thank you for to you, Laura, for a very fascinating talk. Very nice presentation. Thank you. And now it's time I'm for sorry. questions and comments. Raise your hand if you have something to say or ask. Era. 
Well, I have a bit more technical question. What, what is your view on different software for uh, Bayesian networks and what have you used and what's your well, what's your view on different software? Well, clearly I've decided to use R because I, I have uh, I, I'm not very keen on using licensed software. So this has been um, fairly different to what most Bayesian network modelers would use. Um, so I'm, I'm always for that, although it's probably easier to use a license that someone has made for using graphical models. But it's it's nice to know what goes what goes around behind all those model simulations. And yeah, this is my view. <laughs> uh, are are there multiple uh, libraries for modeling Bayesian network in R? Are you familiar? Uh, Fairly limited, I would say. Uh, the B and Learn, which I have used, is one of the key ones. And then for different kinds of more simulation exercises, there are other kinds of Bayesian packages. But for these networks in particular, I've only worked with one. Um, I think MATLAB has a broader selection. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. I think we will move on. We will now actually move on from the modeling to a bit different aspects of AI. And we will start with a presentation by Nitin Soni um, from Aalto University. He's a professor in or at the Department of Computer Science. And um, we will hear about the ethics in urban and environmental AI engaging global South and indigenous perspectives. Please go ahead. I am delighted to be here. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm having a little trouble sharing my screen. It's just giving me a spinning wheel when I try to open the share options. Does this mean I have to log in and out of Teams again? Uh, um, or has anyone else had this problem before? We've had this problem sometimes with Mac computers. So, oh, okay. <laughs> do, so do you have one uh, of, I'm on, of those? Yes, I'm on a Mac and uh, it's doing that to me. So I wonder if I should restart Teams and join back. I wonder if that would make a difference. Uh, you, uh, can, you can try that or you can also try sending your presentation it's, to. It's too long. It's too large to send, I think. Um, okay. If you don't mind, maybe everybody can take a, a two-minute uh, stretch. Yeah, yeah we'll take a stretch and, and yeah, you guys are yeah, okay. We'll try to Thanks. figure this out. Yes, thank you. So if you have the same problem as I had last time I yes. uh, gave talk, so you have to give rights for team uh, teams. Uh, so it does go to settings when you okay. try, do, and do. then you go to settings, click the lock, 
from the do settings. Do I do that or does the host does, do, does that? Oh, sorry, so you, you're saying I should do that on my laptop? Yeah, Yeah, maybe. if okay. you have same problem. Yeah, yeah, so where do I go to preferences? So, so it was just that when you try to share, it kind of oh. pops up some like yeah. go to settings or cancel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then you have to select the go to settings option. Yeah, I think it's a rights issue and it's not giving me. Let me see. Is it? I'm looking in my preferences to see if there is a, an option for that. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, but, but Teams is kind of popping up that. And, and so yeah. the main issue is that when this session is like recorded, Ah. Then teams don't like that, and then you have that have to give rights to teams if you have same problem as I had, like it's possible. Two months ago. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not seeing that rights uh, dialogue coming up. So it looks like it's um, uh, for some reason not showing me. Uh, if anyone else can tell me where that is, I could try to fix this. But I don't see an option unless the. Huh. Would you tell me maybe share your screen and show it as it on Mac? Yeah. Or did so I watch? actually, I actually don't know where is it, it is. So it was just like from dialogue, it just opened the oh, okay. right okay. menu. Does it does it help if I pause the recording for a moment? You can try. I think Tom, you mentioned that it's the recording of the. Yeah, it yeah, might be. Try that the for a second. Okay, I will try that. <laughs> 